Uh, thanks for joining us today. So I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Stephanie Falkland this morning. So Stephanie is a PI at the Donders Institute and the leader of the language and communication team across the Donders, uh, Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics and Radboud University in the Netherlands. Uh, since 2020, she has been a visiting professor at the Technical University of Munich or TUM, as well as an associate uh, professor at King's College London. In 2022, she won the OHBM Education Neuroimaging Award and was elected program chair for OHBM. She's on the editorial board at Cortex and Brain Structure and Function and reviews for a diverse uh, range of journals and several international funders. And she's also a book section editor for Human Neuroanatomy as part of the forthcoming Encyclopedia of the Human Brain. Uh, recently, she co-founded an NGO, the Neuroscience Alliance or Neural the liaises with clinicians and academics uh, from low to middle income countries to improve equitable access to research. And uh, on top of all of that, uh, she also chairs the Science Communication Channel CNSS Seminars, uh, which is a seminar series that is uh, focused on clinical neuroanatomy. So uh, yeah, without further ado, I'll hand over. Thank you very much for the introduction. A pleasure to be here this afternoon for me, this morning for you. Um, and thanks for mentioning the Clinical New Anatomy Seminar channel. Uh, as you can see on the slide, um, here we go. Um, you will have on several slides, you have a little prompt to the channel. So if you want to dive deeper into any of the specific topics, there is usually when you see that symbol, a dedicated talk just for that one slide that I'm showing you today as an overview. So um, today is my pleasure to talk about our work on brain networks and cognition. And we can look at brains uh, usually post-mortem, but for the last couple of decades, we have the privilege of having neuroimaging techniques that actually let us study the same brains repeatedly without the need to wait uh, for post-mortem specimens to be available. Now, another advantage that we have with using neuroimaging is that we can not only look at the surface, but we can also slice through the brain to look at the subcortical structures hidden deep inside the brain, or we can look at functional anatomy of the brain by putting people in the MRI scanner, give them some fun or not so much fun tasks to do, and see which parts of the brain light up. Now, a fascinating advancement for me is that we can also look at the connections in the brain. And there's really only two methods that let us do that. And one of them is postmortem, and the other one is based on a method called diffusion weighted uh, tractography, where we can dissect out in the living human brain those white matter connections. So, what do we know about the white matter? Well, as I mentioned, uh, there's two methods. One of them is postmortem. That is obviously the older method that we have available to study the white matter. And what you can see here is three examples chronologically ordered. So on the very left, you have the example of a, a specimen prepared by Johann Christian Reil. And he developed a method that revealed for the first time the cause of most of the association bundles running beneath the cerebral convolutions. Now, Rice's method uh, was basically to soak the brain in brandy, um, and it works. We, we can see we get beautiful uh, pictures from it. And most of the dissections that he performed were then about a decade later, confirmed by Karl Friedrich Burdach. That's the second image you can see here. And he not only replicated, as we would call it today, the anatomy of the brain in his uh, beautiful book called The Structure and the Life of the Brain, but he also introduced a Latin nomenclature to the white matter that we're still using largely unchanged in the current international nomenclature. Now, in the 1930s, uh, something happened that changed white matter dissections, and you can already appreciate that by just looking at those three images I'm showing you. Obviously, the first two are drawings, and the last one is a photography of the original dissection that is still available at the University of Basel. So what changed in the early 30s is that uh, Klingler developed a new method to dissect the brain that was based on freezing and thawing 
the brain to reveal the white matter tract. Now, another thing that happens uh, with Klingler is that he worked with anatomists, neurosurgeons, and other scientists, and his models and dissections of white matter are still pretty much the most elegant ever created, and they're available to uh, have, have a look at in Switzerland if you ever get a chance. Now, this method is uh, based on freezing and thawing the brain iteratively multiple times. So preparing the specimen actually takes quite some time. And ideally, the minimum is eight hours, but ideally the longer the better. So if you have up to three months of time, uh, this is what you should do with the brain, ideally. Now, because he worked with so many scientists, he also created a school that is still very active today, for example, in Zurich, Istanbul, and Little Rock. So covering quite a range of the world where the direct, um, where the people that were directly trained by him are still using this method. Now, I had the privilege to learn the method from uh, those people. Uh, and here you see me dissecting the brain. So I briefly want to mention what it takes to do it. And the first thing is it takes a very well-prepared brain. This is not just take a brain and do the dissection. This really has to be prepared the right way and carefully uh, gone through that repeated cycle of, of freezing and thawing the brain. And you need a lot of patience. This is not a quick and easy method to apply. So usually for half a hemisphere, you sit there for about a day. And then if you go medial to lateral, you sit there another day, just to give you an idea of how long it takes. Now, you need to use some instruments, but as you can see in the picture here, they're not fancy tools, they're spatula and forceps. And you just cut them into the shape that you prefer as the person doing the dissections. And then ideally, but not necessarily, you can also use a microscope. Now with those few things, you can then end up with beautiful white matter dissections that look like this, if you're as skilled as Ludwig Klingler. Um, sorry, Josef Klingler. Um, but this takes a while. So you start with the easy ones and you build it up. Um, and some of those that you can see here, even I struggle with to this day. And that is just by doing 17 years of white matter dissections. Um, and I still do them at least once a year. And even after 17 years, I'm still learning many new things about the white matter in the human brain. Now, whilst I was learning the anatomy of the brain, this fascinating technique came about called diffusion uh, weight tractography that lets us study the white matter in the living human brain. Now, one of the big advantages is that postmortem dissections based on Klingler are invasive. And by that, I mean not only are they postmortem, so by definition invasive methods, but you also have to destroy the specimen in, in the process. So there is no going back or changing your mind about where you want it to cut. Once you cut, it's done. Whereas with tractography, you have the advantage that it is in vivo. It's based on MR imaging, so you can always go back uh, to the same specimen. You can dissect all the white matter in the human brain. Um, and what you can see here is a couple of examples where we um, actually did both, um, not in the same person, obviously, but where we combined uh, tractography with post-mortem dissection, and that is a mean to cross-validate each other. And there's an entire uh, course on YouTube if you want to learn more about the ins and outs of how to do that. Now, why do we need tractography? So tractography is a fantastic tool in our arsenal of methods that we can apply to develop new models of how cognition in the brain works. We can also use it to map into individual variability in the brain. We can use it to look at atypical cases. And by that, I mean people who have a lesion in a part that is not the textbook area for the clinical presentation they present with. And I'm gonna show you an example of that in a minute. 
and we can use it to systematically map these connections and symptoms in patients. So let's start by looking at some of these examples. Um, and here you see three famous cases in neurosciences who really started the discipline. And that is because all three of them had an accident or a lesion happen to them that changed their behavior. Now, because of the location and the resulting behavioral change, the behavior that they lost or the function that they lost was then attributed to that part of the brain. So the first example here is Phineas Gage. He uh, used to be a railroad construction foreman who's remembered for his improbable survival of an accident where the large iron rod that you can see in this image was driven completely through his head, destroying much of his left frontal lobe. Now, these injuries reported were reported to affect his personality and his behavior, and that placed um, executive functions, inhibitions, for example, in the frontal lobe. Now, the second patient you can see in the middle is a patient from Paul Broker, and the brain is still preserved in Paris. So again, if you find your way over here to Europe, do and have a to go and have a look at the brain in the museum. Now, Broca's patient, as you can see, had a lesion to the inferior frontal gyrus and that rendered him unable to articulate language in a uh, long sentence format. So he was stuck on the syllable tongue. That was all he could say. And in 2007, Nina Drunkers had the privilege to uh, come to Paris and actually scan the very brain because it's still preserved as it is. And that offered us for the first time the ability to look inside this uh, famous brain and really appreciate the lesion extent uh, that was caused by this stroke. Now, the last patient uh, is better known as patient HM. And he had a bilateral medial temporal lobectomy, as you can see in this image, to surgically resect the anterior two thirds of his hippocampi to cure his epilepsy. Now, unfortunately for him, that rendered him unable to form new memories. So these are the famous cases that build that school of localizationism, where one part of the brain is associated with a particular cognitive function. Now, if we now look at tractography in those very same patients, and this is something that Michel thibaudet Schotten did back in 2015, um, this is really a way of tractography age. The iron rod disconnected many intralobar connections of the frontal lobe, but it also disconnected the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe by cutting through the uncinate fasciculus. Now, in the case of Broca's patient, we can see that, as one would expect, the lesion extended into the arcuate fasciculus to uh, cause a language deficit, but also a myriad of other white matter connections, including the frontal aspen tract or the superior longitudinal fasciculus three here in this example. Now, in the case of patient HM, the lesion actually affected the entire white matter of the limbic system. So what this study really showed is the extent of a lesion into the white matter far beyond the cortical damage that we are all aware of. Now, if we look at language in the brain, which is what we do most of the time in the lab, but not always. Um, we also have our models of areas and connections in the brain. So here uh, you have a picture of Paul Broca, and we've already seen the brain. So we have a region in the frontal lobe that is important for articulation of language. Then Karl Wernicke came about and he said that, well, I can see patients who have a lesion there and struggle to articulate, but there's another group of patients who have a lesion in the posterior temporal lobe, and they can articulate, they're completely fluent, but they're struggling 
to understand what they hear and what they actually have as an output is um, jargony. And he therefore postulated the first model of language in the brain, whereby you have the center for articulation in the frontal lobe and a center for comprehension in the temporal lobe, and those two are connected. Now, in the 1970s, Norman Geschwin, the American neurologist, revisited the uh, neurobiology of language in the brain, and he added the inferior parietal lobe, particularly the angular gyrus, into the model. And now the connection is going around the Sylvian fissure, connecting Broca's angular gyrus and Wernicke's area. Um, and that is the arcuate fascicular. So this is the classical model of language that if we talk about language in the brain, this is usually what people have in mind. Now the area in the inferior parietal lobe was uh, attributed to Geschwind in the early 2000s and is now often referred to as Geschwind's territory. So what you see here is that classical language in the brain anatomy with those three cortical areas and the arcuate fasciculus directly and indirectly connecting those areas. Now there is however a problem with this model um, and that is that we are quite different between us. And I started putting a disclaimer out because I was challenged on us not having the same definition of what variability is. So the disclaimer is that to me, variability means that our brains are different. They do not have a fixed pattern and they're liable to vary between us, but also across time. So let's look at the magnitude of variability. In neuroimaging, we often use template points. So this is an example here based on the Human Connectome Project data, where you can see areas where people are more alike, so less variable in the center of the brain, for example, and the boundaries here are very crisp, very sharp boundaries, meaning that everyone aligned nicely in this particular part of the brain. But when we look at the temporal lobes, for example, we can see that the template is a bit more smudged and the boundaries are less sharp. And that is because there is more variability in these areas that leads to blurring of the template. Now, to give you an example of how uh, this variability actually looks like in individual participants, you have two examples here. On the left, we see the visual cortex and you can appreciate the variability between the left and the right visual cortex in the very same person, but also across different participants. Now, when it comes to the motor cortex, it's usually taught uh, in university that you can identify the hand knob area by finding this inverted omega sign. But in fact, once you start looking at a lot of brains, you can see that not everyone has the omega uh, to identify the motor cortex, and it can be anything between a straight line or this epsilon shape that you can see here. So this is then what we know about the variability of the brain. So here you see an MNI, beautiful template brain, my brain, and a textbook. And you can see that all three brains have roughly the same areas and roughly the same parts of the brain, but they're exact uh, association to each other and their extent in these parts of the brain varies greatly. Now looking at the white matter, this variability is even exaggerated and you can see that here by a beautiful arcuate in the MNI brain, a slightly smaller arcuate in my brain, but then uh, compared to a textbook for example, the arcuate is huge in the beautiful Gray's Anatomy textbook and actually connects frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal area. Now, this is obviously a single case example, but just want to highlight that it's not just my brain that looks different, but that we are all different. So this is an example from a study we're currently running uh, here at the Donders, where we dissected the uh, language networks in three healthy participants here. 
And you can appreciate if we look at the posterior segment of the armpit fasciculus, it's a very thick connection in the first participant and rather thin in the second participant. If we look at the uncinate fasciculus, so the one that connects the frontal and temporal lobe that was damaged in Phineas Gage's case, you can see that in participant one, it's barely visible. And as we progressively go to the right side of the slide, that connection uh, becomes a lot more prominent. So there is a huge degree of variability in the structure of brain connections. Now, obviously it's not just a structure that can vary, but we can also see that in functional imaging. So here's an example of a classical fMRI task where you have uh, the hand area and the tongue area identified by fMRI imaging, and you see the variability between uh, participant one, two, and the group average. And we can also detect those patterns of variability using resting state imaging. That's a study here by Ruby Kong, where you can see the same kind of networks in the same kind of areas of the brain, but where exactly they are and the extent of those networks varies between the participants, but is consistent within the participant across days. So where does that leave us for using cryptography to define new models? Well, if we look at the visual system and the auditory system here, we can appreciate that they're hugely complex systems. But obviously, due to obvious limitations, uh, we cannot test the same or apply the same method that we use to get those complex diagrams of visual and auditory systems in the human brain, because that's ethically not allowed and is also extremely invasive. So what that meant is that the model that we have of language in the brain in most textbooks still looks like this. Now, if we assume that our primary functions like vision, auditory, are already as complex as indicated by these diagrams, then I guess we can all agree that a higher cognitive function like language is probably even more complex than the visual and auditory system. So what tractography has added to the language connectum is more and more connections. So we can visualize the classical arcade fasciculus in red here uh, on the left. And then the early 2000s, Marco Catani in London identified this indirect segment that reaches the right lobe. And since then, many more connections have been added to the language connectome, and they all have been uh, related to language functions by using other means to test their involvement in linguistic functions. For example, neurosurgical approaches, lesion studies, or direct electrical stimulation studies. Now, this is how we can use tractography to form new models in the brain and then bring it back and test them in the clinic. Now, tractography in the clinic is also important because here what you can see is a stroke patient that I recruited many years ago. And on the left, we see the CT scan, then the structure T1 scan, the diffusion-weighted scan, a T2 scan, and a perfusion scan. And even for an untrained eye, it's obvious that some of these sequences highlight an area of damage a lot easier than other areas. So when we look at the CT, for example, you have to have some kind of training to be able to identify that there is a stroke if I were to remove the red line around it. Whereas on the perfusion scan on the far right, for example, it's very obvious that the left and the right side of the brain look different. Now, across these scans, what they all let us do is identify that the lesion extends into the white matter. And that means that the extent of that damage into the white matter might vary depending on the type of scan you have, but they will all identify that there is some degree of damage to white matter connections. Now, what none of these scans can show us, however, is which white matter tract is affected and by how much. And that's why looking at connections in uh, clinical patients is 
extremely important. Now, I mentioned earlier that we can use it to look at atypical cases. And here's one such example where you can see a tumor and the edema around the tumor, and you can see Broca's area. Now, the reason Broca's area is highlighted in this particular patient is because this patient presented with a Broca-like aphasia, meaning articulation was impaired, but comprehension was intact. Now, by just looking at the structural scan, that does not match textbook knowledge because Broca's area is perfectly intact and not affected by the tumor. When, however, one does the tractography in this patient, you can see that even though the tumor doesn't touch Broca's area, the edema around it actually encroaches on the long and the anterior segment of the arcuate fasciculus and therefore can explain the clinical presentation with Broca's like aphasia. Now, I just want to put out a slight caution uh, to highlight why in clinical populations using a atlas approach is a cortical spinal tract visualized in blue. And what you can see uh, from this little cutout image is the lesion and the vectorial impact that lesion had on the surrounding tissue. And that resulted in the cortical spinal tract being pushed more medial than you would anticipate it to be if you were to use a atlas. So this is just a, a word of caution that in clinical populations, relying on atlases might be difficult. Now, another example of an atlas is this one. So this is a uh, spherical convolution atlas from 2015. And what I want to show you here is the example that you often get clinical notes where it says there is a lesion in the insula, for example. And the point that I want to make here is that the clinical presentation changes depending on the type of disconnection. So an insular lesion, if it extends ventrally, for example, would disconnect tracts like the optic radiations leading to hemianopia of visual agnosia. If that very same lesion however extends medially, we're now disconnecting the medial, uh, sorry, the um, cortical spinal tract. And now this patient would more likely present with a hemiparesis or somatosensory deficit. If that very same lesion extends dorsally, we're now disconnecting the arcuate fasciculus and this patient presents with language deficits of some sort. So the take home here is the clinical presentation changes depending on the type of disconnection. And again, for that to be impactful, we need to know which connection is impacted. We need to know exactly which white matter tract we're talking about. Now, in terms of the variability that I've already shown you for uh, individual brains, we did this study with Paula Croxon in New York in 2018 where we mapped variability at the group level. And this is the first map of white matter variability in the brain. Now, there's a couple of things you can appreciate here. And the first one is that variability in the gray and the white matter is not homogeneous across the brain. And this can be seen here by the warm and the cold colors on the cortical surface and the white matter highlighting areas of high and low variability. Now, <clears throat> what this study is showing us is that variability changes across the brain, but also there is a gradient of variability whereby older and deeper parts of the brain tend to be more alike between us. And we've seen that with the template that I've shown you in the beginning where the boundaries around the subcortical structures are very crisp. And as we go more to the lateral parts of the brain, there's an increased variability. And again, the template, those were the parts that ended up being a little bit blurry. Now, this is the variability at the group level, but I was very much interested in individual white matter tracts and their association to cognition. So I set out to do what I thought at the time was a quick weekend study and ended up 
looking at those papers for a year with my colleagues because we found 326 studies that looked at structural variability and differences in cognitive functions in healthy controls neurological and psychiatric patients. And there's three things here that I want to highlight to you. And the first one is that most of what we know about the functions of the white matter, we know from clinical populations. So about 45% after studies looked at neurological or neurosurgical patients, 29 at psychiatric patients, and only 25% of the studies looked at healthy controls. The second thing is that not all brain connections are studied equally across the cohorts. So if we look at the cortical spinal tract, the very first one on the list, it's a very prominent connection in neurology, but a lot less prominent in psychiatry and healthy controls, for example. Now, <clears throat> the third thing that I want to show you from this study is that variability in anatomy is related to variability in cognitive profiles. And importantly, when the connection is damaged, it also causes uh, variable clinical symptoms. So I'm highlighting the arcuate fasciculus here that so far I've introduced to you as a language pathway, but in fact, when we look at literature, it doesn't only correlate with measures of language, but also with measures of sleep, memory, executive function, auditory attention, and motor functions. So the conclusion here really is that we don't have one region, one function, as we've seen in the historical studies, but also we don't have one tract, one function. The pattern is a lot more diverse than a one-to-one -one mapping between the anatomy and cognition and behavior. Now, in some of these studies have shown us, however, that studying the white matter is a reliable measure of variability in anatomy and is related to cognitive differences in health and in disease. And I want to show you two prominent neurological disorders next. One is stroke and one is neurodegeneration. So for stroke, uh, what we did is we recruited patients in the acute stage and then followed them up longitudinally at six months and again at one year. And they underwent neuroimaging, that's structural and diffusion imaging, and also neuropsychological assessments. Now, what you see here on this graph, on the y-axis, is the recovery after six months, according to the Western aphasia battery. And on the x-axis, you see the size of the arcuate fasciculus in the healthy hemisphere. So in this case, they were all left hemisphere stroke patients with a definition of aphasia. Um, and they had an arcuate in the right unaffected healthy hemisphere. Now I highlighted three patients for you in this example and you can see patient number one on the far left of the graph actually didn't recover very well six months after symptom onset and when we looked at the arcuate fasciculus it's quite a thin connection in the right hemisphere. Patient number two that's slightly better after six months and we can see that the arcuate is slightly bigger. Now, patient number three, according to the Western aphasia battery, completely recovered back to normal. And that patient had a really thick, strong connection in the right hemisphere. Now, what is important here about the study is that when you only look at clinical and demographic data to predict recovery at six months, you can explain about 30 to maximum 40% of the variance. By adding the variability in anatomy to the model, we can actually improve the accuracy of prediction to nearly 60%. So this was quite an astonishing achievement um, that the variability in anatomy has such a huge impact on predicting recovery. Now, the second example uh, that I promised you is a neurodegenerative um, population. And those are patients with primary progressive aphasia. So uh, the first symptom is the loss of language functions. 
And one of the hallmarks of this disease is repetition deficit. Now, repetition deficits were classified as the first disconnection syndrome in the form of conduction aphasia. And this was already put forward by Wernicke, where he said that if Broca's is intact, you can articulate. If Wernicke's is intact, you can understand. But if the connection between the two is interrupted or disconnected, then you have a repetition deficit because the information that you hear cannot be sent to the frontal lobe to be repeated. So in this classical model, conduction aphasia is a disconnection syndrome of the arcuate vesicles. Now with the emergence of CT imaging, however, there were more and more reports that actually showed that more superficial lesions to the inferior parietal lobe also cause a clinical presentation of conduction aphasia and thereby shifting that model to the inferior parietal lobe. Now, what we did in this uh, study, we looked at the white matter and the gray matter to try and disentangle those two uh, scores. Now, quite to our surprise, when we looked at repetition and the arcuate fasciculus, so the long segment here, we found no correlation whatsoever. What we did find, however, was a correlation between repetition deficit and the indirect segment, so the green and the yellow that relay in the inferior parietal lobe. In terms of the cortical areas, after correcting for multiple comparison corrections, the only area that was still significantly correlated with repetition deficits was, in fact, the inferior parietal lobe. So here, the posterior supramarginal gyrus. Now, based on this data, we then revised the model and brutally took out the long segment of the arcuate and proposed a model that looked more like this, where you can have a lesion pretty much anywhere along the system, and that will cause repetition deficit. So you can disconnect the anterior or the posterior segments of the arcuate, or you can have a lesion to the cortical areas they're connecting to, and it will cause repetition deficits. However, the flavor of those deficits might be quite uh, different. Now, what this study shows then is that considering neuro variability in neurodegeneration radically changed the way we think about conduction aphasia or repetition deficits and allows us to propose a new anatomical model of conduction aphasia. Now, I want to use the reminder of the time to give you a little preview of the recent work that we were doing and the ways forward that we envisage. So here is a study that was published last year where we tried to combine different methodologies. So in this study, we use functional data from 144 participants in Bordeaux and those participants underwent various language assessments in the scanner, amongst which there was a reading task. So from this fMRI data set, we then generated the T-maps and the average threshold of activation maps, classical fMRI pipeline. On the other hand, there was data from 1,333 stroke patients, so just the lesions, that were then used in a software the BCB toolkit to get the patterns of this connection. So you put the lesion in a tractography, uh, tractogram, connectome, whatever you want to call it, and it returns to you the pattern of this connection, i.e. all the white matter that was affected by the presence of this lesion. Now, combining that, we could use the stroke disconnectum to decode the patterns of language activations in the brain. And what that lets us do is it lets us map the functional network of reading in this case, but it could be applied to any other fMRI data set that you have. We could also dissect out the white matter that was critical for reading deficits. So in this case, the 
U-shaped fibers in exonus area and the vertical occipital fascicula. And we could use it to get a distribution of the lesions that explain the variance in reading deficits. And here you see the lesion that captures the most variance uh, in the symptom presentation. So thereby, this is a very predictive lesion of reading deficits. So this is one example of how you can combine methods these days to improve um, our understanding of the anatomy and cognitive impact. Now, another thing that Leah Talossi recently did in the lab was apply a machine learning algorithm to those disconnection patterns and based on that, make predictions, long-term predictions of the outcome of stroke patients one year down the line. And this is really something that has been absolutely missing in the literature to have reliable long-term predictions. And she did a fantastic job in this paper and actually tested this method against a plethora of other methods available and other approaches. And that is a very strong prediction of um, clinical symptoms long-term. Now, another study that we recently published looked at the language uh, network in the brain and the computational power that you can achieve with these models. And if we look at the modular model of language, so the classical Broca's does articulation, Wernicke's does comprehension, the, the modulations you can have in the system are extremely limited to the point that the complexity of language would not be explained by this model in its entirety. Now we also have a hierarchical model where those areas are connected. For example, in the uh, reading example that I gave to you, you first have to comprehend and then you send it forward either through the direct or the indirect route to the frontal lobe for articulation. Now this model already gives you a bit more flexibility, but it still doesn't capture the complexity of language in its entirety. So we postulate that a integrative model actually captures the complexity of language much better by dynamically adapting and activating areas and connections as they are needed. So really the idea here is that if you ask a neuroscientist where language is in the brain, that's as good as asking a orchestra where their song is. Now, I wanna leave you with a beautiful quote and a call to action before I finish. And here is the quote taken from this beautiful paper by Peter Stern called No Neuron is an Island. And in this paper, he postulates that the brain is so much more than its constituent cells. Each neuron in the brain connects with thousands of other neurons, but instead of a cacophony of connections, we have a synchronized symphony. And I think this is absolutely beautiful and leads to my call of action, which is be like a neuron, go out there and connect and try to make as many collaborations across the world, because I think together we can achieve much more than each of us alone. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take your questions. Um, hi, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I was wondering, um, since you have the chance to actually actually like a see real human brain um, dissecting all these tracts, I was wondering if you have the chance to also look at the uh, different ages and um, you show a population um, a map showing the variability, uh, but I was wondering uh, if, what do you think uh, in terms of does diffusion weighted images actually reflect um, all the tracks or like is that, is, is a technique that is very accurate when you when you have the chance to, to look at the real brain? So basically, uh, what uh, do you think about the technique and um, how is, in uh, across the ages that the tracks vary right that's, that's just, i think there was three or four questions in there so let's try to go through them one by one um does diffusion imaging capture the real anatomy of the brain that is the one million dollar question um 
the answer is yes and no. So let me expand on that a little bit. The problem that we have is that there is no gold standard of what the connection anatomy of the brain actually looks like. Um, and that may sound confusing, especially because I've shown you the white matter dissections with Klingler, where you actually see the brain and you assume that this is what the brain looks like. But the problem here is twofold. Number one is in order to expose the white matter, you have to scrape off the cortex. So you can't be sure where those white matter connections are actually terminating. So we have a very good idea of the trajectory of the white matter, but in terms of the terminations, that's a little bit harder. Now there's new developments where you can take pictures at every single step and then try to reconstruct that to give a, get a proxy of where those connections uh, likely go in the cortex. The second thing is that this process of freezing and thawing the brain also might artificially introduce artifacts into the anatomy. And that is because when water freezes, it expands, and when it thaws, it reduces in size again. So that can lead to two possible artifacts. So one is that it pushes white matter together that isn't necessarily closely together in the living brain. And the second thing is that it could also artificially separate white matter that should be together. Um, so that is the, the, the missing gold standard problem that we have. Now, does tractography reflect the anatomy as we know it? Um, it does, but that's also because the algorithms were perfectly synchronized to look like white matter dissections, because that is the best proxy of the true anatomy of the connections in the brain. So it does reflect it, but there is a slight circularity um, issue here, if you want to say so. Now, another question you had was about aging. Now with um, the postmortem dissections, we don't really have the privilege to dissect all the different ages because those brains are not easy to come by. Um, and you can't proactively recruit them unless you're collecting specimens for a biobank. Um, so for postmortem, it's a lot harder to say. With imaging, you can go through the different ages or age bins, however you want to do it, and look at the variability and how that changes across the lifespan. Thank you very much. Okay, great. We, we have a question in the room. Uh, yes, so thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. Very, very interesting talk. So I have a question kind of building on Cindy's question. More, more technical, so like, um, do, would you say like, uh, for example, uh, more advanced diffusion MRI acquisitions are necessary to look at the, to reliably look at the variability in tractography, for example, like multi-shell, or can you do it with any like standard single shell acquisition? So you can do it with a single shell acquisition, um, but the anatomy might vary depending on the algorithm that you use. So if you use an advanced algorithm, you can reconstruct more of the crossing fibers, but you also reconstruct more artifacts. Mm -hmm. So then it comes down to how you actually handle that. If you apply an atlas, well, then you have all the limitations that come with using an atlas in the presence of variability. Um, and if you do manual dissections, then you are limited to sample sizes that are hand that, that you can actually handle by manually dissecting it. So we're currently, for example, going through a data set of 200 participants, and we have three people working on this just to get through those numbers. Um, so it very much depends on what you want to look at. There is areas, as I've shown you, where the brains are more alike between us. So in that case, um, they're deeper structures. There's usually slightly less crossing fibers. So you could definitely get away with a box standard uh, tractography acquisition. In areas where there is high amounts of crossing fibers, you might want to consider more advanced methods, but then with the caveat that you probably have to clean up a bit more. 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great. Uh, it looks like we have a question from uh, Nelly online. Hello, thank you so much for your talk. Um, so I was wondering, because you bring up uh, artifacts and you also mentioned that a lot of the studies are conducted in a, a population that have neurological disorders, so probably movement disorders. And um, we know that movement can affect particularly the cortex. So I'm just wondering um, how you take that into account in terms of the variability that you see in the brain structures. So just, just for clarification, do you mean movement in the scanner as in motion artifacts? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, so uh, that is definitely a problem when you scan patients or developmental cohorts. Um, in the brain study that I've shown you with the stroke patients, uh, we first ran our, at the time, super fancy tractography sequence. And very quickly after two or three patients realized we can't do that because patients can't lie still for such a long amount of time. So what we ended up doing in this particular study is we split the sequence. So we acquired the first 30 directions, quick break, and another 30 directions. Now in the break, the patient didn't come out, so we didn't have to do the full realignment, but there was just a quick break in the sequence. And that actually increased the amount of usable data that we had in the study tremendously, rather than running it all in one. So in, in developmental cohorts or in patient cohorts, I would always recommend trying to tweak your sequence to reduce the motion artifacts. <laughs> and then obviously the methods also became better in terms of stabilizing patients in the scanner, but also the motion correction algorithms that we have these days. Thank you. Um, we have another question in the room. Uh, hi, thank you for your great talk. Um, I was wondering um, how you see your results impacting treatment planning. Uh, you mentioned that like uh, you can start to predict some of the trajectory of some patients. Uh, can you also use that to optimize treatment to change that trajectory? Well, that would be the next step. So <laughs> the. Reliable Predictions uh, is a paper that's not even published yet. It's about to come out. Um, so we're at this step at the moment, but obviously the, the goal is once you know how anatomy and function go together, and once you can reliably predict an outcome, then obviously you wanna try to improve that outcome to, for the patient to the best possible potential that is still available in the brain. So yes, absolutely, this is the direction we should be going. I'm just curious, do you work with a speech pathologist for the um, part? Yep. And speech therapist, thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? Okay. I have a question. Um, so, Stephanie, great talk. I, I love like the mix of the history, the methods, and and like the anatomy. Um, uh, so a lot of the examples you showed today were kind of you know primary neurological deficits, um, and the relation of the tractography and the and the white matter indices to those. Then you have, I mean, the cognition experiment is really interesting. Do you have any? Have you thought about using, or do you know people have used kind of these similar types of approaches, but really looking at um, psychiatric symptoms where their variation could be, you know, a lot greater. It almost seems like it would, you know, for example, um, language deficits in, in schizophrenia, right? Like the word salad, the that kind of thing. Have have you um, have you imagined kind of using that dimension of of language dysfunction as, as one of the indicators in um, uh, in in one of these types of approaches? So this method is used extensively in the psychiatric literature as well. Uh, one of the first papers I have was actually looking at auditory hallucinations in schizophrenic patients. And we did saw um, alterations in the arcuate fasciculus in the presence of hallucinations compared to patients who didn't have auditory hallucinations. Um, and Whilst it is used quite extensively in the psychiatric populations, um, the advantage of using it in neurology is that you 
have a much clearer idea of what you're looking for because you usually have a focal lesion or a tumor or a epileptic area. So you, you know where to start with psychiatric disorders is often more difficult to really pinpoint the anatomical changes in the brain. And that's what we tend to see in the literature as well as that for every study that finds a change in the single limb, for example, you find another study that doesn't find it. So there's a lot more clinical variability in that data as well. Thanks, Steph. Um, and I think we had a question in the chat about um, whether or not you have any experience scanning post-mortem brains for diffusion. I do. Um, and I was quite surprised by it because I thought it would be easy to scan post-mortem brains, um, despite the obvious limitation that there really isn't much diffusion anymore. Um, but so what I did is I, I got a brain, put it in the scanner. I was like, oh, I'm going to post-mortem scan the brain. And I had the worst motion artifacts I've ever seen. And that is because there was no weight of the body to actually keep the brain in place. So it was just bouncing about in the scanner. Um, not that as much, but obviously uh, I was quite surprised to see emotion artifacts in a postmortem brain. Um, so one way to control that then was to tailor print uh, in using 3D printing a cask for the brain to keep it in place and stabilize it as well. And then obviously the way you scan a postmortem brain is quite different. So you usually have very long scanning times, much longer than you would scan a participant who uh, voluntarily goes in the scanner. Um, but also the quality of the scan very much depends on how the brain was prepared. So Rachel Barrett, for example, published a beautiful paper where she investigated the amount of gadolinium in the brain, the different B values and scanner settings and how that impacts postmortem um, scanning and uh, diffusion postmortem scanning. So if you look for Rachel Barrett at King's College, you find the paper that has all the details. Everyone's good. So um, at this point, I'd just like to thank Stephanie again for coming and talking to us and giving a really great and informative talk. So uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.